It's a few minutes past now, and I think we've probably got the final stragglers coming in, so I'm going to get things underway. Ina mana ina reo, ina iwi, ero rangatirama, no mai, haere mai, piki mai, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. So to everyone joining us all around the world, and to all the speakers, to all groups, welcome, welcome, welcome to you all. In addition to that, Mihi, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians or the tangata whenua of the land that I'm on today. And for me, that's Ngāti Whātua. I'd encourage you to think about the land that you are currently on. I'd also like to pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. Nō tāmiki mikaura hau hi kaitiaki pukapuka o ke te wānanga o Aranui o tāmiki mikaura ko Lokman Hayes toku ingoa. So I'm from Auckland, from Tamaki Makoto. I'm a scholarly communications team leader at Auckland University of Technology. My name is Lukman Hayes. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Susie Wiles to you today. Um, before I do, I'm just going to skip back to the little bit of housekeeping that we've got here. Um, so please keep your, um, yourselves muted through the presentation. Pop your um, questions in the chat and we'll cover off as many of those as we can towards the end of the session. Um, we're going to be aiming to finish by 5-2, um, because I've got a session immediately after this one, so I'm going to be hopping off of here. Uh, the event's being recorded, and the recording and slides will be available on the website soon afterwards. So most of you, I imagine, will be familiar with our guest today. Dr. Susie Wiles is a microbiologist and associate professor at the University of Auckland. Susie heads up the bioluminescent superbugs lab. I'm really glad I said that right. She's also passionate about demystifying science and often collaborated with uh, artists and um, animators to do this. Many of you will have heard Susie commenting on the COVID-19 pandemic on various media. And of course, her collaboration with Toby Morris has been hugely popular, attracting attention all over the world for its simple but powerful messaging as we work through the changing environment that is dealing with coronavirus. So I'm gonna stop talking now. I'm gonna hand over to Susie uh, and I'm gonna stop sharing my slides so that she can share hers. Uh, kia ora, Susie. Kia ora, oh, hang on. Let me find where my slides have gone. <clears throat> okay, uh, so kia ora and um, thank you so much for the invitation to um, speak today uh, and for the um, kind welcome. Um, yeah, so I thought I'm going to do a little bit of a, just an introduction to me um, and then I guess get into the topic of the week, which is uh, communicating a pandemic uh, in an open access way or how open access has really um, helped, uh, helped us communicate this pandemic. So, oh, it's being really slow, what's going on? Oh, there we go. Um, so uh, yes, I'm a microbiologist. Um, so I run a research lab, uh, the bioluminescent superbug lab. And essentially what that means is um, in my lab, we make nasty bacteria glow in the dark. And the reason we do this is because, um, oh, I'll just remember to set a timer so I can stop on time. Um, the reason we do this is because basically only living um, bacteria will glow. And so we have this really rapid way of telling whether our bacteria are dead or alive. And also where they are just by looking for light. So quite a lot of um, projects going on in my lab at the moment, but I want to talk just about two uh, of the main ones. Uh, one of those is looking for new antibiotics. Um, so we do this uh, with a collaboration with uh, Manaki Fenua, who are one of our Crown Research Institutes here in New Zealand. And they have a very large collection of fungi that have been collected over the last sort of 50 years. Um, and we are trying to see if they can produce antibiotics. And the reason we're trying to do that is, well, there's an antibiotic crisis. If you didn't know, uh, we are running out of these medicines. It's, um, it's, it's, it was a pretty dire sort of state of affairs before we got to a pandemic. Um, it's probably gonna be even worse uh, with the pandemic. Um, but also the first antibiotic ever really discovered was uh, penicillin, which comes from a fungus, uh, penicillium. And so the idea is that uh, New Zealand has, you know, animals and plants found nowhere else in the world. And so uh, would our fungi be any different? Um, would we be able to find essentially new chemistry from these fungi? 
So the idea is that we basically take our glowing bacteria, we put them with the fungi, and then if the lights go out, that suggests that the fungi is making something that is um, uh, impacting on the bacteria. And then we basically grow up large amounts of that fungi and send it to our chemistry colleagues to try and identify what, the, what is causing um, our lights to go out. Oh, so there's basically Bevan, who's the uh, curator of the, uh, the collection. In my lab, we have these glowing bacteria. And then essentially, if we find any um, chemistry, that's the sort of job of our chemistry colleagues led by Brent Kopp. The other project, um, uh, main project in the lab, uh, though, is a uh, kind of an interest in transmission of infectious diseases um, and asking the question, what makes a microbe infectious? So one of the great things about our light is that, you know, our glowing bacteria is that we can see them. So what you can see here is a picture of basically a mouse cage uh, with um, mouse poo and glowing mouse poo. That's the mouse poo that's got our bacteria in it. Um, and that's because we're studying a bacteria that causes a form of food poisoning uh, in mice. And then what you can see is an anesthetized mouse where we can visualize the bacteria glowing inside that animal while it's asleep. Um, and so with this, uh, yeah, we're asking the question, basically, how do bacteria evolve? Um, how do they become infectious? And in a way that we can study um, using these animals. So as a researcher, um, I'm really interested in, uh, in open access um, because it just, the whole way academic publishing works to me uh, is basically broken. And so back in 2012, if you're um, not aware of it, there was a, a, a mathematician started this boycott of Elsevier called The Cost of Knowledge, and I was a signatory to that. Um, and it really is just, a, I guess, a, a reaction to the fact that, you know, that we create knowledge using taxpayer money um, we then, you know, write up that knowledge uh, in journal publications. We, uh, for free, perform most of the duties the journals need to turn that knowledge into a publishable form. And then, uh, in, certainly in the biological sciences, we will pay page charges, um, more if you have colour figures, uh, for the journal to, um, to, to publish it. Uh, and then, obviously, our institutions pay again <laughs> to access that knowledge. Um, it's just, it's, yes, an absolute rort. So um, back in 2012, 2013, I made a commitment that the, uh, the stuff that we published would be available open access because, obviously, our peers um, need to read it. Um, and not all of them are at universities that can, uh, can you know, access uh, those um, or have subscriptions to those journals. But of course, it's not just about our peers, right? It's about everybody else um, who needs access to that knowledge too. Um, one of the other things about me though, is that I, I really firmly believe that science and research doesn't end with a journal publication. So I've spent the last 10 years, uh, maybe more than that, learning how to communicate um, in different ways to different audiences uh, so that we can you know, more broadly get at the ideas around um, our research out into different communities. Um, so lots of people will have seen me, uh, you know, talk on TV about uh, both my research, but also now more broadly about other um, other things happening in science. I'm often the microbiologist who's called to, on to answer questions about microbiology, um, but I also have the privilege of having um, a science slot on our uh, national radio where I get to talk every fortnight about different science stories. And so obviously it's very difficult to talk about science stories if you can't read the papers. And so I also try and um, talk about stories that are published in or papers uh, that are published in open access uh, way so that also if people want to read those papers, um, they can. I've also written extensively for um, other uh, kind of online media, including the spin-off. Um, and uh, as Lookman said, I've also been involved in working with animators and things. So uh, this is just a, a clip from an animation we made um, about uh, fireflies and showing how NASA used that firefly reaction to um, look for extra extraterrestrial life. Uh, and then finally, from a science communication perspective, um, I was also uh, basically made a little um, show uh, for kids about microbiology with my daughter Eve. Um, and we basically made sort of four episodes of this show, um, one of them about my research and about fungi and antibiotics, another about um, glowing creatures, uh, one about our microbiome, uh, and then in probably the funnest, um, we made uh, cheese using the bacteria between our toes. Um, so this has been a kind of really fun uh, way of communicating. 
so yeah, up in that stage, so I was basically doing research, running a research lab and um, uh, with this commitment to open access, uh, doing science communication, uh, and then the pandemic arrived. And so for me, my life just became basically putting the science, my lab aside uh, and focusing on the scientist communicator uh, side of my, um, I guess, of my skills, uh, trying to I explain to everybody what was happening uh, and, you know, what was very, um, and it tended to be a very fast moving, um, I guess, uh, story really. Uh, and the only way I can do that is by having access to the knowledge that is being produced. And so I think that this pandemic has shown that, you know, it's really, really important to have, you know, for everybody to have access to the knowledge that's being made. Uh, you know, the normal idea of, you know, a six to 12 month embargo on things, you know, it slows down progress, it does, but it doesn't, you know, it's not, it's not, I guess, that big a deal. But in a pandemic where things are changing on a day to day basis, where people's lives matter, you know, this is something where we've just shown how important that um, a commitment to having uh, things available to everybody has been really important. And I think actually even more exciting than that has been the use of preprints. So to see that now being embraced by the biomedical research community has been fantastic. And it's obviously something that's been used by mathematicians and physicists for a long time, but to now have biomedical scientists sort of jumping on board has been great. I guess the caveat with that is we've seen both the best of science and the worst of science played out in this way, you know, where we've seen um, horrendous, I guess, academic profiteering where people have jumped on board, you know, um, applying their skills to the pandemic when they shouldn't have. Um, and then that playing out in the preprints and that ending up in the media. Um, but I think on balance, it's been a good thing for um, science and for, uh, you know, how we publish our research. Uh, so I started doing things, um, you know, and on TV and radio, but I also started writing uh, um, uh, extensively for the spinoff um, when the pandemic arrived. Uh, and so this was a way to, in, you know, longer form, um, talk about the papers that were coming out, what we did know, what we didn't know, and be able to link to those so people uh, could read them if they wanted to. Uh, and, you know, this is this is really important, right, because this is a global pandemic. Um, it is happening, you know, it means everybody everywhere needs access to that. Um, and as I said, many people who need access to that information are not going to be um, in institutions with access to, you know, with subscriptions to the journals. Uh, and many of them are in, you know, governments and policy um, making roles, um, you know, who wouldn't be subscribing to things. So uh, it's really, really important that we have access, timely access to all of the information. Uh, and that it's equitable access to. So for my uh, sins, I started working with uh, this um, fantastic cartoonist, Toby Morris, um, to try again and to uh, kind of expand the things that I was writing into a more graphic form. Uh, the collaboration started with um, when we saw the graphic for the idea of flattening the curve, this concept of flatten the curve came around. Uh, and so I approached Toby to say, you know, it'd be really nice to make a version of this that better encapsulates what, you know, how you actually flatten the curve compared to the, um, the visions of a, the visuals I'd seen in the, in the past. Uh, and so that's what we did, but we have done many more since then. So it was sort of the start of amazing uh, collaboration, which brought my uh, science expertise and Toby's incredible skills uh, at visual communication to communicate anything about the pandemic that people needed to understand. Uh, and we've used access to the primary literature to do that too. So this is just one of our examples. This is showing how COVID-19 uh, impacts on our body and the virus. Uh, and we have, you know, cited the references. We've shown there the stuff from Med Archive. Um, you know, we're showing the paper so that if people want to go and have a look, they can see what our, um, what our you know, what studies we've based it on. We've also started dating things. <laughs> we found this very important because it has moved so fast. I think it's really important to put this kind of date of when the thing that we're doing, you know, that's the knowledge that we have at the time. What we found with this virus is a week later, you know, that knowledge could be different. Um, but one of the kind of fundamental things, I guess, that was important to me when Toby and I started working together was that we would release these graphics under a Creative Commons license. Um, and this was something quite different for Toby as an illustrator who, you know, is not used to doing that. Um, but I talked through my reasons, which was we're in a pandemic <laughs> uh, and we need to be able to allow people to adapt these um, graphics to suit their purposes. 
I've had one example I've seen where somebody suited it, used it to adapt it to um, underplay the pandemic. But on the whole, most people have used them as the communication tool um, that they were intended to be. So we've had them translated into multiple languages. Oh, yeah, so our first one uh, went viral. This is the flatten the curve um, one. Um, here's the Prime Minister of New Zealand holding it up <laughs> uh, in one of her press conferences. Um, but essentially, the, the, by releasing them under this Creative Commons license, you know, that gave people express permission to translate them, uh, to adjust them uh, in the way that they um, saw fit. And as I say, in the vast majority of cases, in fact, almost all cases, um, that has been done in an appropriate way. The one thing that's been interesting has been to see people not, so we released it under this um, CC BY share alike license. That means that people need to cite us. Uh, and the number of people who haven't done that have just taken our concept and then sort of scrubbed down names off has been kind of interesting. Again, not a huge, um, Toby and I are not hugely upset about that because, you know, in the grand scheme of things, this is a pandemic. And so it's more important that the messages get out there. But it's been really interesting to see how incensed um, the social media has got on our behalf. So lots of people will send us adaptations of our work and go, it's not fair. They didn't include you. <laughs> they didn't cite you. But um, we're okay with that. Uh, so this was another one around that went really um, viral, uh, showing the concept of exponential spread and how our actions can um, uh, can basically stop that exponential spread. And so it's been really good to see this one adapted to different circumstances, because this for us was very much um, a sort of a New Zealand uh, kind of version of it. Um, so we've seen this uh, shared by the Australian government, shared by the German government uh, in India. The picture you can see is it on a, I think a German kind of bus um, sort of stand or something uh, in animated form. Um, yeah, so we're just seeing these things. Um, I think it's also, it's kind of interesting, the ones that have taken our concepts and adjusted them to their color schemes and, and their things. I think for Toby as an illustrator, that's been a little bit like, oh, <laughs> what have you done to my beautiful work? Um, but again, trying to get the message out there has been what was more important to us. Uh, and this one um, actually made me quite tearful to see. So we uh, were approached by this um, Children's uh, Law and Policy Center in the US uh, who wanted to um, create some uh, resources for people in the youth justice system to try and show them that their actions could stop young people from getting COVID-19. And so to see, you know, these options are, do you issue a verbal warning rather than arrest somebody, you know, all of these kinds of things was, um, it just shows what we're facing. And so it's really amazing, I guess, that our graphics have been able to be, uh, to help in this way. You know, we've heard that they've been translated for use in, um, uh, in refugee camps, uh, you know, all these sorts of things. It's, it's quite humbling, I think. Okay, so if you're interested, um, basically all you have to do is Google bumper box set Toby and Susie and you'll find the list of them. Uh, we've covered everything from uh, genome sequencing, contact tracing, uh, you name it. Um, the idea is, you know, to get things in a form that's easily shareable and as I say, Creative Commons so it's easily adaptable for other people. So that's kind of, I guess, open access to information and sharing. Um, but the thing that, the direction I want to go in a little bit um, is that actually there's a, there's a more fundamental question um, here uh, than just access to the scientific information that we're generating. And that's really the process of science. So this little image is just to show what most researchers will understand that basically, you know, the the process from asking a research question to communicating your results is a long process. You know, there's the background research, there's actually doing experiments, there's all of this kind of thing. Um, and yet, we basically shove all that, more or less, in a black box. And what we do is we communicate our results. Um, so this is a problem. And I think what we're going to see with the pandemic is um, it's this is an opportunity, I guess, for being more transparent about what's being done, for sharing things in a better way, uh, including data rather than just results, you know, like the conclusions type of thing. Um, but also, I think this is quite important for transparency around the vaccines, especially, and treatments, I guess. So what data really is being generated? How is it being generated? Uh, and can people have access to that data to analyze it in different ways? 
So I guess, you know, the, the impression we often give when you do uh, research or when you write a paper is that it's been a more or less straight path from beginning to end and then publication of the results. But of course, anyone who works in research knows that that is not true. And there are tons and tons of dead ends. You know, you go all over the place before you actually get to what is published in the paper. And I think, you know, this is really, really important when we're in a, in a, a global emergency where we're trying to rapidly, you know, test drugs, understand things that it's so important that we make these dead ends known that you know we don't um, waste time and resources following down things that other people have already followed down, I guess. Go down rabbit holes others have already gone. It's just a massive waste of time and resources. So I guess I kind of want to end with, um, you know, open access to the papers are, is really important. It's really important for, you know, for us as scientists, it's really important for the policymakers, for the journalists, for everybody. But it is not the end of the process. And actually, what I would like to see more of is transparency of both the data that's generated and how it's generated. And I love this um, image from Red Pen, Black Pen, which really shows that, you know, uh, this analogy of, you know, the paper is published as basically your beautiful house. The supplemental data is kind of all the, <laughs> the stuff in the basement. But actually, what happened uh, is really the monsters underground, which is, you know, all of the other stuff that we um, have done that isn't seen. Um, you know, this is what we also need to reveal. And we need to be transparent about all of the data. We need to, um, you know, make that available. And this, I think, is where is one of the hardest things because you know I thought converting to an open science lab was going to be a relatively easy process, and actually we spent the last two years in my lab trying to figure out how to do it because it turns out that just opening up your lab books is not the same as making your data and your processes uh, understandable, um, really properly shareable, uh, you know, machine readable, um, and. And that stuff is really, really hard. So to do actually reproducible science is not the same, but reproducible open science is what we need, uh, you know, both to get through this crisis faster. Um, and I really hope that we use this opportunity um, well to kind of establish those, um, those sort of protocols. So I think with that, I kind of sped through this. Um, I think with that, I will um, stop sharing and maybe we can move to kind of questions and, and uh, discussion. So, yes, where's my host? <laughs> cool. Uh, uh, thank you, Susie. I wasn't expecting it to be so quick, but yeah. Um, that's <laughs> cool. Sort of Zoom um, through it. Apologies. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, so there were, there were a few questions in the chat, but uh, I've written down a few questions of my own, but while you were talking, because it threw out quite a few things. Um, but let's just go back to the chat just very briefly. And if anybody wants to add any more there, feel free. Um, there was a question around uh, the languages uh, for the flat and the curve animation. Um, how many languages were it, was it translated into? Yeah, so I don't know the answer to that, actually. It's something I need to um, find out. I, we've, we've been pretty slack at tracking them. Um, there was an amazing guy who, uh, he created some kind of resources where people could just type their language in. It was like some kind of code and it would sort of automatically translate them. Um, but I don't, he started doing that kind of with each one. I don't know how far he got. I know there are quite a lot of different versions of them on Wikipedia now that have been put up there in different um, languages. Uh, but all sorts of things. We've had Turkish, we've had, um, you know, like anything really. It's it's kind of been amazing. What we're doing now is converting all of this, the the, written versions of each one into a script um, that we can be a bit better about giving that to people if they want to do the translations and stuff. Um, here we're translating them into, we've got a, a couple of great collaborations to translate them into Tereo Māori and into um, some Pacifica languages. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're available. The tricky thing for us is the um, uh, re removing the English version to change the language uh, because it's something that actually takes a bit of time and Toby now is extremely busy with other things so he doesn't have time to um, to do all that uh, but we did just recently get um, asked by the uh, the I think the chief public health officer in Canada they would like to use the the graphics but they can only use um, them if they're bilingual so we're currently converting them all into French for them to start using them um, 
but yeah, it's they're they're kind of available and, and they could be in anything, I think. And we need to, I think we need to hire a research assistant who can start now tracking them for us and looking at where have they gone. Because we never really, you know, we just did it intuitively, knowing that if we re release them Creative Commons, people could do that, but we never really tracked it. And I think maybe now we should actually should actually see what we've done. What beast did we really release? <laughs> cool. Uh, thanks for that. Um, Ashley asked a good, good question around um, issues with preprints and whether there's been any problems with media picking up or cherry picking not such great open access preprints or articles and using them essentially to promote misinformation. Um, is, there a, is there a way to handle that? Is there a good way to deal with those sorts of issues? So I think the reality is that not only are we seeing preprints being used that way, but we're seeing traditionally published things being used that way too. So it's really clear, and actually there's some research being done on this now, that the time to publish is also dramatically sped up, right? Even in those, so going through peer review, that is being done way faster for COVID-19 related papers and other things. Uh, and so we know that there's misinformation, well, we know there's basically cherry picked and false stuff that's appearing as preprints, but we know exactly the same thing is happening in reputable journals. So I think, I mean, one of the things that I've been working on from this side is to try and educate journalists about what these different things means. But I don't think you can actually say just because something's a preprint, it's more likely to contain misinformation compared to something that is published in a legitimate journal. Because we have seen, you know, the, the quite stunning thing um, is we are seeing some very reputable scientists and researchers publishing very cherry picked stuff. So it feels to me like this pandemic is it, you know, as it is with everything, it has shone a light on all sorts of inequities in our society. It's doing exactly the same thing for both the good and the bad around research, how we communicate it, how we do it, how we fund it. All of these things are being shone a very, very large torch on. And I would really hope that we as a community look at that really seriously and try and figure out how we can fix some of these very, very big problems. Problems we've known about for a long time, but you know, in in a pandemic, <laughs> you know, they're 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 costing lives. Sure, um, and as you say, with greater transparency comes greater scrutiny, and theoretically, that then leads to um, better science. Um, I'm going to be completely biased here and pick a question out about libraries. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on what you, I mean, this, this goes hand in hand with what you talked about earlier, I suppose, and the potential barriers to openness. What, what can libraries do to assist with making research and processes more accessible, do you think? I guess, you know, you're, you're um, fighting back against the subscription model, I think. Mm. And, it, and obviously it's a really tricky one because um, subscriptions, you know, there, there are society journals that really rely on those subscriptions. So we kind of need a different way of doing this. And I, and I see, I see librarians and libraries as our allies in this, right? Because, um, you know, you are, you are curators of knowledge, holders of, you know, look, you look after that knowledge and you want others to, you want others to understand how to access it and how to understand it. And so we are allies in that, in, in that, um, you know, we want people to be able to access things uh, and, and good stuff. And so um, helping researchers, I guess, I mean, we know lots of researchers also know nothing about open access and know nothing about the roles libraries play, know absolutely nothing about the amount of money that's being spent on, sorry. <laughs> no, you know, they know nothing about um, the kinds of things that are, that, that, the, the struggles that libraries face in terms of, you know, what journals they can subscribe to and all this kind of stuff. And so it feels like we do, you know, I know, I know this is a movement that's been going for a long time, but, you know, with every new generation of researchers, depending on who they've been trained by, you kind of need to start again, right? So I think librarians are part of that education of researchers too, to really think about when they choose, you know, a journal to publish in, what the consequences of that might be. You know, mm. and ultimately we need to be working on how do we change the incentives within the academic structure, you know, that, that, that essentially, you know, those, those people who uh, publish in some of these, you know, pretty appalling practices journals, <laughs> 
you know that that's that's seen as a really prestigious thing. So th those are those are the sorts of things that we can come together and all work on on how we how we end those practices. Yes, I think what's happening, interestingly enough, is that publishers are responding to the call for open access, but this is leading to these things called transformative agreements, which are shifting, really shifting the, the pot of money from one place to another, from <laughs> um, pay to read to pay to publish. Do you think that addresses the problem of access or does it just move it around a little bit? I guess it, it does. It does address the problem of access. Mm -hmm. um, but we do fundamentally need to talk about why academic publishing is one of the most profitable industries in the world. Mm. Like, you know, this is just, it, it's, it's a way of, you know, think of how much more research we could do, how much more knowledge we could generate if those public, if those, if those profits weren't going to, you know, weren't so vast. I, I have no objections to people being paid to do work, <laughs> uh, although of course in academic publishing, loads of those who do the work are not actually paid. Um, but it's about the grossness of it. It's about it's it's indecent the amounts, and that is taking money away from actual generation of new knowledge, new knowledge that's really important for combating climate change and combating pandemics, and just generally in in understanding the human condition. Right. So that's the conversation we should be having. I think that these are obscene profits. Um, that it's um, in many cases taxpayer uh, funding that's that's generating those obscene profits, and so that money would be better used somewhere else. I think. <laughs> cool. I, I'd like to ask this question now uh, from the chat, but I have a feeling we've kind of covered this. Um, there is some concern in the community that as we focus on open access to research outputs, we lose sight of the thinking, the blob at the bottom. And this is slowly being subsumed into proprietary formats. And then we will discover later that this thinking has been lost. Any thoughts on that perspective? I'm not sure I understand this question. I'm not. <laughs> um, so, I mean, my argument is that we should not only op open up the research outputs, but we should open up the research process and our, and our thinking, right? But what I was trying to articulate was, I was really naive and I thought this was going to be easy. Like I, you know, several years ago went on Twitter and said, so I want to, I want my lab to be an open access, you know, open science lab. How do I do that? And people are like, well, you just do what you do only in the open. And it turned out I was actually asking a different question. And the question I was asking was, how do I do reproducible science? How do I generate knowledge uh, in a way that others can build on that knowledge uh, or can, you know, like, or can take our data and do stuff or repeat our things. And it turns out that's actually not the same as just opening up our process. <laughs> you open up our process and you go, oh my God, that process is terrible. That's what I've realized. <laughs> so for us, we've embarked on this kind of, you know, two year process of how do we make our, our processes itself? How do we reveal our thinking? How do we do that in a systematic way? And it's hard because it actually takes a lot of time away from doing the research. I mean, this is the, this is the complaint I've had from my lab is like, we just want to be in the lab doing science. We, you know, all of this documenting everything is taking us away. Um, and it's getting over to them that yes, but that's as important a part. So I'm not really quite sure how to answer that question. I'm not sure what the, sure. the need is. So in order to make your lab more open, what do you think is needed there? Just better, better infrastructure or um, better support within your institution? What's missing there? Oh, I, um, oh gosh, <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, so for us, it started with a lab manual, which has been a laying out of commitments and a this. So to explain what that process is, that I want us to do open and reproducible research, and what that means to me. The question then is how you turn that into a process and how you turn that into a, these are the rules, but maybe not so strict that people can't follow them. You know, when you do something, this is how I want you to document it. And I think just the realization that that takes a lot of time. Uh, yeah. And so people get frustrated with that because they often come into a lab, a research lab like mine, a wet research lab wanting to do the actual stuff. They don't want to do all this other thing. So there are probably ways I should probably be working with someone who is more a process person to help us try and do that. But um, I think when you when you've got projects, you can start from the very beginning by building that stuff in. It's one thing. But when you've got something that's been running for many years, trying to fix it, <laughs> that's what's really, really hard. Mm. And that kind of ties in with a question from earlier, which was around 
um, how, how do we approach the reluctance of researchers to share their data in areas that are highly competitive? Um, so this question is, says they've come across researchers who can get on board with making the finished product available, but are much more cautious about releasing data. Yep. And this, I think, is where our institutions and our funders have got to be on board. I mean, we have to fundamentally change the way that academia uh, is, you know, where, the way people progress, the way they are, uh, what they're, how they're incentivized and how they're rewarded. And at the moment, we have a system that rewards keeping things secret so that you're not, you know, you, you are not um, scooped or anything like that. Uh, and even potentially kind of keeping bits of the story aside, right? I mean, this is, this, this is the system we've, we've built incentivizes that behavior. And it's going to take a huge amount of work to break that. And so I guess the only people who can mandate that are the funders of science. And they can say, for us, if you want our money, you cannot behave like that, which means there have to be consequences for those who don't behave like that, right? Or, or, who, or who do um, end up just continuing that bad behavior. So I guess that's the thing the funders have to come on board. One of the things I, um, I applied for some of the um, uh, Wellcome Trust open, uh, like open research funding a few years ago, and it was really quite delightful to see that they didn't ask for a CV. They asked basically just for, um, they wanted me to say what were the things that I had done. Uh, I had to name five things and say, basically why they were my outputs that I would choose. And it could be a publication, it could be a data set, it could be uh, something you'd done that it had, you know, great impact. Um, and I really liked that they were moving away from that, we want to see your list of high impact publications to, well, if your data set is something that's really important, tell us about that and how others have used that. So I feel like some funders are moving in that direction. But we kind of need everybody on board and they do, I think they need to move faster and they need to be, um, they really need to be disincentivizing the other kind of behavior. Mm. Um, because what we've seen is, you know, we absolutely need access to uh, data sets. I think it's going to be especially important around COVID-19 and vaccination. Like we absolutely have to see what the data is, is that's coming from the vaccine trials and they need to be you know, be able to be scrutinized by independence, right? And um, my worry is that if, if there's any hint that people are behaving the same way as they have in the past, that will massively damage um, confidence in vaccination. Um, and we can't afford that. I'm just hoping there's some, uh, some research funders listening in today. I don't know if there are. <laughs> or anybody from the Tertiary Education Commission. <laughs> Um, I mean, there was a review of uh, our PBRF, the, the um, Performance Based Research Fund in New Zealand, and I know that some of the comments made in that review were all about the stuff you're talking about now, that changing the way in which we evaluate research and, um, and the way in which this, we incentivize things. Um, there are a couple of other comments, uh, a, lot of, a lot of congratulations and good jobs, and <laughs> and so on and um and adrian makes the point that there is that we don't have any funded any mandate for um government funded research to be made open access in new zealand and that's that's true and that's again another barrier mm. uh another good question here is that is, is there an argument for uh, layperson communicators like toby to get more involved in Communicating, communicating academic ideas and getting across the concepts in different ways. Uh, is there room for new, new types of collaboration? Oh, I, I yes. <laughs> I mean, the, the, I guess the most, um, one of the, the biggest realizations for me is that, you know, I'd always hoped as a researcher, a biomedical researcher working on a fairly big problem that I would have some impact with, you know, my work that maybe at some point in the future, my lab might be part of some, you know, big enterprise that had developed new antibiotics or something. What I've seen is that through collaborating with Toby, um, I can actually have, a, you know, an impact straight away uh, in, you know, in a crisis and doesn't necessarily have to be in a crisis, right? Um, so I, you know, I, I would hope that our story shows that by I, I, guess, I guess we could just look at the metrics if you're interested in metrics, right? You know, as a, as a, as a researcher, I, I, mean, I can't remember what my H index is. I've got a few thousand citations to my papers. 
the, the, since, Jan, well, since the end of January, when I started writing for the spin-off, um, the pieces that I've written have had over 3.2 million views. Uh, you know, our graphics have been seen by millions. So if you want to do, <laughs> if you want to look at metrics, <laughs> you know, but somehow those are not, again, they don't, they don't, they're not as prestigious, right? Because it's like, oh, it's just people <laughs> yeah, rather than your peers. Um, so I think, again, if we want to do these kinds of collaborations, we need to make sure that we do not create an environment where uh, where the scientists who are, will need to be involved in those collaborations are penalized in any way. Because as a communicator myself, I have had a very difficult road to this stage, right? Uh, you know, I've spent 10 years learning this craft because it was important to me to learn to communicate in different ways. I could see the value of that. But I have had many people throughout my career who do not see the value of that and who have, you know, basically made assumptions about my, the, the quality of my research and all sorts of other things because they have seen me excel at science communication. So the last thing we need is setting up loads of collaborations between scientists and illustrators. You know, it's something that we need to do for the generation of knowledge and for transferring that knowledge. But I would hate to see a generation of scientists then penalized for doing that because it's seen as taking them away from the real work, which is the writing of the papers and stuff. So again, that goes to changing our incentives, changing our structures, and making sure that people value that communication, regardless of the audience that it's going to, and saying, you know, it, do, you know, it does not stop with the publication of the paper. I mean, we've seen some, you know, there are some incredible comics um, there's the PhD comic guy who does collaborations with artists, uh, sorry, with scientists to, you know, to make comics out of their stuff. So there's, there's lots and lots of people working in this space. I think it's a, I think it's a great, you know, it's a great growth industry. Uh, if there's money to be made from communicating, I would rather it go to creatives like Toby <laughs> than to Elsevier, frankly. <laughs> so, um, you know, cause it will get, you know, again, it will go wider than, than just a paywall, right. And, 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 journal so um yeah but i think we have to be very careful about how we do that sure um just a couple of comments in the chat which i'll read out they're not questions um and then i think we'll probably wrap things up um uh margaret donald says the fda requires access to all data and and to all data analysis plans we used to perhaps we should demand that those data be open in other words, drug companies could fudge their journal results, but not the data or analyses to the FDA. Yeah, and I guess one thing to say from this, so Ben Goldacre in the UK has done a huge amount of work in this space trying to, um, uh, you know, ensure that or, or push for trials data to be, you know, for, for trials to be registered in the first place. So you know that a trial is happening uh, and then to push for it to be published within the timelines that, you know, that, that these mandates are for, right? And, you know, and his research has shown that actually there's, you know, the, 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 for example, the US has uh, the ability to fine people and, and organizations and drug companies and everyone if they don't release their um, results uh, or even publish their results after a certain time. And, you know, the last time I looked at his tracker, nobody had been fined. So, like the government was missing out on millions and millions of dollars in fines because they weren't making that, you know, that mandate work, right? They, were, they weren't doing it. So he started this great initiative, which was basically when a, when a, um, uh, when a trial that had been registered hadn't, had reached its stage where it was supposed to be uh, published, he would start writing a little, it was like, right, well, this one hasn't been published and this is why it's important why we know this, right? So um, we, I think we have some great people agitating in this area, but we have governments around the world who, you know, should be making more of a stand in this. I guess the current, I can't imagine the current administration in the US doing it, um, but, you know, again, it's kind of what do you value? And for those, you know, the trials have to be registered so you know they, uh, they're ongoing. And then at least if the data isn't released, you know there might be something fishy about it. Mm. Uh, the final comment I'll read out um, from Bruce uh, is around the data from the Consul Open Access Project, which ran last year and then recently the, the data was rerun. Uh, and that showed that only around 50% of publicly funded research in New Zealand is open to the public. Um, 
research funded by Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, the figure is 33%. I mean, I just think this is a travesty, right? Yeah. <laughs> but again, I mean, in that, you know, in that respect, um, MB are responsible. MB as the funder can say, from now on, this has to be available. And they can make sure that the, the, that that's, the funding is put in place to do that, right? You know, if it's an open access charge, then they can make sure that's done. Um, so I would like to see our institutions, our fund, funders, like really realize how crucial this is and then make it work because they are the ones that can do that. They, they can mandate it. And that might mean taking a bit of money from somewhere else, but I, yeah. It's just, I think that's, that's absolutely crucial. And that seems a really good place to end. A call to action for radical change in a completely different academic publishing arena. Um, I want to thank you again. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> yeah, no pressure. Just a complete transformation. That'd be fine. Um, and then uh, following this call, there'll be a complete decolonization. <laughs> so um, thank you again, Susie, for, for giving up your time today and um, giving us a great talk. And uh, thanks to everybody who listened in. We had a, a huge number of you. Um, if I missed your question or your comment, do feel free to, um, to email it to me or to uh, Ginny Barber, um, and we'll try and collate everything. Uh, as I say, the recording and the slides will be on the, the website in due course. So thanks again. Uh, big mihi to uh, Susie and Kakite Ono. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.